Good morning, everybody, and, and welcome to worship at Emmanuel on this Reformation Day Sunday. You should know that what happened during the Reformation made a big difference not only to Lutherans and Calvinists, but also to Catholics who have changed over the centuries because of the Reformation. It was a signal event in the history of the church. If you'll stand, please, we'll have the greeting and then greet each other. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you, mercy and peace, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us greet each other. Let's do the Shema together, uh, repeating after me each line. Hear, O people of God. The Lord is our God. The Lord alone. Love the Lord your God. With all your heart. With all your mind. With all your soul. And with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us sing our praise.
Good morning, church. Be seated. Um, just want to make an announcement. Um, we're going to start our potlucks up again, Linda Scott and I. Um, and our first potluck will be November 14. And it's going to be a Thanksgiving potluck because I just feel I look back at this year and a half and there's been so much that's happened. We've had so many losses. We've grieved so much. It's time for us, church, to start being thankful for what the Lord has done during this time. And so um, I have a sign-up sheet in the back where you can sign up. We'll provide the turkey if you want to sign up and help us provide some of the food. Um, we are going to have a couple of tables that are going to be for those that have trouble doing the potluck um, with carrying the food and all that. It's going to be family style for you. You can sit around your table and you can just help yourself with the food. The rest of it will be potluck. We just don't want to leave anyone out. So if anybody wants to, everybody that wants to come, if you can't bring food, no problem. We'll feed you. Um, but those of you that would like to help and provide some of the food, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Thanks. I'd like to welcome the deacons to come forward, please. Let us pray. Gracious God, we return to you now some part of the money that you have provided us. Follow these gifts with your blessing. Let them be handled wisely and let them do good. For Jesus' sake, amen. Please pass the fellowship folders while the offering is being taken.
children may come forward for their blessing. Congregation, repeat after me. The Lord bless you. Amen. We may go to children's worship. Jennifer may do the congregational prayer. Lord, we come to you today in the autumn of the year and are amazed at the beauty of your creation. You have created the leaves that change to glorious colors, the brilliant fall sky, and we feel the temperatures change from humid and warm to crisp and cool. Your creation is majestic and beyond our ability to grasp. Even more difficult to grasp is how much you love us. Your love is so great that you sent your only son to live as one of us in this world, he gave us a perfect model to live by and then died for us so that we can live forever with you. What perfect love. You alone are worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. Yet, merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you with our words, our thoughts, and our actions. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, and strength as you have commanded, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Have mercy on us, O Lord, and cleanse us from our sin. Create in us a new and right spirit. Lord, you have blessed us in so many ways, in ways that we often remember, like food, shelter, and clothing, but also with relationships, like family and friends, meaningful work and ways to bask in your creation. We praise you for schools in our community and teachers who are so dedicated to instructing our children. We thank you for hospitals and amazing health care that is so easily taken for granted. We thank you for those in our community who serve, who dedicate their lives to making the lives around them better. Help us to acknowledge and thank them for making an impact in our lives and in the life of our community. We lift before you today those of our church family who need you in a special way. We pray for Rose Dykstra, Gail Crickey, Ella Jane Newenhouse, Michelle Butterworth, Lori Kuinga, Sharon Andersma, and Pete Van Rice. We pay, pray for Pastor Jake and his family. Bless them with a time of rest and relaxation so that they are rejuvenated for the work of the church. We pray for missionaries working around the world, and today we especially think of those that we are in relationship with. We pray for New City Kids, Zuni Christian Reform Mission, Jason and Marcy Brink, Lee and Carolyn Boss, Harry and Sarah Gorwer, and Michelle Vandesteg. Give each of them a special measure of your grace, peace, and love. Now, as we prepare to open your word, we pray for Dr. Planinga. Thank you for his presence with us today. And now speak through him the word that you want each of us to hear. Open our hearts to receive it. In your name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I'll just mention that <clears throat> it fills my heart with warmth to come to Hudsonville because the love of my life, Kathleen Talsma, is a graduate of Unity Christian, and she was well-educated. Scripture is Luke 21. 
25 through 36. Let us hear the word of God. This is about the second coming of Jesus. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life and that day catch you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and stand before the Son of Man. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We live in between the first coming of Jesus Christ and his second coming, and most of us feel a little bit better about the first one. Christmas is about a baby, after all, and that makes everything easier. We know about babies, and so we know how to domesticate Christmas. We set up a creche, pin up a wreath, set out a poinsettia or two. Maybe we sing away in a manger in the alternate tune. All together we figure out how to manage Christmas so that the little Lord Jesus, asleep on the hay, won't end up scaring anybody. But the second coming is something else. As the Swiss theologian Karl Barth once said, we can't fathom the second coming of Jesus Christ, and we stammer when we we try to talk about it. And I think I know part of what Bart had in mind. Part of our problem is that the Bible describes the second coming of Jesus in language that is hard to interpret. The language is apocalyptic, which means language that reveals the world beyond the world we now inhabit. It's a revelation that talks about the transition from this age to the next. And the transition is rough. It's full of emergency. According to the gospel scenario, everything breaks loose at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Nations go to war and civilians run for cover. There's blood in the streets and famine in the fields. The earth shakes and the sea roars. There are signs in the sky above panic on the earth beneath, stars falling, people dying of panic. It's a whole drum roll of disaster. And then, as the gospel says, in the midst of all this, people will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud full of great power and glory. He's the incoming Lord. He's the oncoming Lord. He's got power to judge and power to save. And when he comes the second time, he will be too big to miss. At the end, he is God without disguise, as C.S. Lewis once put it. God without disguise who comes at us so unmistakably that he will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. It's the climax of the human drama. Christ coming to finish what he started. Christ coming to gather his saints and vindicate his martyrs. In this event, so we Christians believe, in this event, 
all the hopes and fears of all the ages are met in him one last time. So why does the second coming make us squirm? What is it about this topic that can make Christians a little bit uneasy? Well, one thing is that we don't know how to read the literature, and in particular, we don't know how literally to read it. Another thing is that the church has been expecting the second coming of Jesus for over 2,000 years, and he hasn't done it yet. It's hard to stand on tiptoe for 2,000 years. And after a while, people settle down. People settle down into a kind of everydayness in their faith, and they quit scanning the horizon. The way this works out for most Catholics and confessional Protestants is a kind of interim faith a common-sense Christianity that say, stays fairly close to the ground. We don't deny the big, booming events to come, such as the Second Coming, but we don't really think about them so much either. We've still got church and sacraments, after all. We've got scripture and prayer. We've got preaching and the Golden Rule and the Ten Commandments, and every week we faithfully spend some of our money on kingdom needs. That's ground level Christianity and it's just enough religion to keep most of us going. Why does the second coming make us restless? Well, we have trouble with the literature, as I said. We can't figure out God's schedule, as I said. I'll propose a third reason. I think that a lot of us over the years have been secularized enough that our view of the world has flattened out. And so the second coming of Jesus Christ doesn't really fit in very well to a flattened out worldview. It's too fantastic. It's too supernatural. In certain moods, we think it's too embarrassing. It's an embarrassing advent. So we leave it to those embarrassing Christians who have learned apocalyptic speculation and turned it into a billion dollar industry. Prophecy buffs with their computer charts and wrong predictions that are then folded back into new predictions in a kind of prophetic improvisation that Paula Fredrickson once called apocalyptic jazz. Prophecy buffs clicking away with their pocket calculators and preachers telling us with great confidence exactly when Jesus is going to come back. And it's all a little bit alarming. Alarming to read those bumper stickers that say, beam me up, Lord. Distressing to see those four-color laminated placemats of the rapture, complete with wrecked cars, and crash jetliners. Some of us are a little uneasy about the second coming. And I think I understand. But now let me ask you one question. Is it better to ignore the Lord's return? Is it better to live with a low ceiling over our lives and no room there for the incoming Lord? We may be the sorts of people that Jesus warns in our passage. Watch, he says, heads up, be alert. Pray that you will have the strength to stand when the Son of Man returns. Jesus says this to people who have given up on the second coming and have settled into a kind of ground level religion. At this level, their hearts get logged Their hearts get weighed down, as verse 34 says. These are people who weigh themselves down with worldly anxieties and then relieve them with worldly amusements. Jesus mentions drunkenness in particular. People worry, so they get drunk. They get drunk, so they worry. And this makes them want 
to have a drink. In the classic addiction cycle, people try to relieve their distress with the same thing that caused it. And so they trap themselves. Watch, says Jesus. Be alert, says Jesus. Jesus says this because his return isn't just an apocalyptic fireworks display. His return is the coming in fullness of the kingdom of God. It's the coming of justice in the earth. When the signs appear, says Jesus, to a whole temple full of listeners, don't give up, don't freeze up. When these things draw near, stand up and understand that your redemption has come. Your redemption is drawing near. In Luke 21, Jesus is talking to people who know something about redemption. These are Exodus people. These are Pentecost people. These are people with a history of being squeezed by Egypt and Babylon and Rome. To these people, redemption is the longing of their heart. They want Rome off their back. They want Caesar out of their hair. It's their dream. It's their hope. The coming of God's redemption means that justice will at last fill the earth. Liberation is coming. The king of all the earth is coming. When biblical people want redemption, they cry out, Oh God, save me. Deliver me. Bend your ear toward me, O oh God, and in your righteousness, save me. Do we know anything about passion like this? I'm thinking that when our own life is good, our prayers for the coming of the kingdom get a little bit faint. We whisper our prayers for the coming of the kingdom so that God can't quite hear them. Thy kingdom come, we pray, and we hope it won't. Thy kingdom come, we pray, and we think, but not right away. When our own kingdom has had a good year, we don't necessarily long for God's kingdom to come. When life is good, redemption doesn't sound so good. That's how things go. God's redemption is good news for people whose life is bad news. If you are a slave in Pharaoh's Egypt, if you are a slave in antebellum Mississippi, you want your redemption. If you are an Israelite exiled in Babylon or a Nigerian paralyzed by corruption, you want your redemption. If you are a woman in modern India, and it doesn't matter what caste you belong to, if you are a woman in modern India and your husband or fiancé doesn't think your family has come up with a big enough dowry, and if he locks you in a closet for three months or calls up his buddies and, has, and then threatens to have them rape you and kill you, you want your redemption, your redemption with every trembling of your heart, and you want it with every fiber of your being. According to scripture, the person who wants redemption wants the kingdom of God to come in its fullness, whether he or she knows it or not. And the coming of the kingdom depends on the coming of the king, the one who will return with power and great glory. However we are to understand this apocalyptic event, whatever form it takes, the second coming of Jesus Christ means to a Christian that God's righteousness will at last fill the earth. People with crummy lives want it to happen now. If you are a Christian in sub-Saharan Africa today, you don't 
yawn when somebody mentions the return of Jesus Christ. When an epidemic has devastated whole populations, you want your Redeemer. You want the one who has healing in his wings. Passionate Christians want the return of the Lord. And so do compassionate Christians. When our own life is sweet, we can look across the world to lives that aren't sweet. We can raise our heads and our hopes for those lives. We can weep with those who weep and hope with those who hope. We can look across the room, across the world, across the pew. It's natural to hope for ourselves and how healthy it is to do it, but it's also natural for Christians to hope for others who so much need the redemption of the Lord. Be on guard, says Jesus, that you don't get weighed down with parochial anxieties and parochial amusements to relieve them. Be on guard against that fatal absorption with yourself. Take care, stay alert, stand up, and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Jesus' words are an antidote to our sloth, an antidote to our worldly cynicism, an antidote even to the scorn of prophecy buffs. Jesus' words are meant to raise our heads and raise our hopes. Could justice actually come to the earth? Could certain husbands quit beating up their wives? Could wives quit blaming themselves? Could Arabs and Israelis look into each, other, into each other's eyes and do it with respect? Could some of us who struggle with addictions or with diseases that trap us, could we be liberated and start to walk tall in the kingdom of God? Could Jesus Christ appear among us in some way that awakens our minds and er erases all our smug confidence about where the lines of reality are actually drawn. If we believe in the kingdom of God to come, we will pray and we will hope for those who have so little hope. And one more thing, we will work in the same direction as we hope. In a wonderful book entitled Standing on the Promises, my teacher Lewis Smeeds says that longing for others is hard, but it's not the hardest. Praying for others is hard, but it's not the hardest. The hardest part for people who believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ is in living the sorts of lives that make people say, aha, now I see what life is going to be like when the kingdom comes in its fullness. The hardest part is simple faithfulness in our work and in our attitudes, the kind of faithfulness that shows we are drawn forward toward the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I close with this. According to a story that Oz Guinness tells, 220 years ago, the Connecticut House of Representatives was in session on a bright day in May, and the delegates were able to do their work by natural light. But then something happened that nobody expected. Right in the middle of their session, the day turned to night. Clouds obliterated the sun, and everything turned to darkness. Some legis legislators thought it was the second coming. 
So a clamor arose. People wanted to adjourn. People wanted to pray. People wanted to prepare for the coming of the Lord. But the Speaker of the House had a special take on this. He was a Christian believer, and he addressed the House of Representatives with a wonderful logic. We are all upset by the darkness, he said, and some of us are afraid, but the day of the Lord is either approaching or it is not. If it is not, there is no cause for adjournment. And if the Lord is coming, I, for one, want to be found doing my duty. I therefore ask that candles be brought. And men who expected Jesus went back to their desks and resumed their debate. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you who died and rose for all your followers, on this Reformation Day Sunday in your year 2021, we turn our hopes toward your second coming and the day when you will fill the earth with your righteousness. Amen. It's time for us to sing How Great Thou Art.
God go before you to lead you. May God go behind you to guard you. May God go beneath you to support you. May God go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. Let the blessing of God come upon you today and settle in around you. Do not be afraid. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you.